morning and welcome to this Harnessing the Power of Geospatial Data in Immersive Tech and Gaming event. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting this event as part of our Geospatial Insights Innovation Network here at the KTN. Uh, my name is Andy Bennett, uh, Space Specialist, and I will be helping to introduce the sessions and hopefully keeping things to time. So before we get into the core of the event, I will briefly mention the technical side, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but uh, it's always good to go over this. Um, for this webinar, you'll see there's a Q&A function and a chat box. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions of the panelists. You can upvote your favorite questions so we know which ones to ask as well. Um, and if you, uh, you, if you can use the chat box for general comments, uh, or if you have any technical problems where our excellent events team will be able to help. We will be recording the session and uploading it to our website after the event. So if you want to go back and view again or share with colleagues, then please do. Um, for this event, we'll be using Meeting Mojo to allow webinar registrants a chance to book meetings with each other. A bit of virtual networking, if you like. Uh, meetings will take place between 1 and 4 p.m. today, and each meeting lasts 15 minutes. Poonam is now sharing the uh, platform URL in the chat box, so please register and follow the instructions to book meetings. Uh, we're also using a virtual reality platform, Laval, um, if you'd prefer that. So Asher should be sharing the link on that right now as well. Um, so if you've missed those serendipitous meetings with potential partners and collaborators, I encourage you to give either platform a go. So now back to the core of the set today. So a key element of our role at KTN is to connect across sectors, people, geographies, and to respond to challenges and drive positive change through innovation. Business is at the heart of what we do. However, our diverse connections span government, funders, research, and the third sector. KTN has built a network of innovators, business, academic, and government contacts to open up new opportunities beyond existing thinking, accelerating ambitious ideas into real world solutions. We use our networks to develop insight and understanding on innovation and often then publish our results. For example, our, our innovation network recently produced the power of place in collaboration with the Jordan survey. This explores how geospatial intelligence is shaping our world and how through collaboration, systems thinking and collective intelligence, we can unleash the innovative potential of location to deliver a sustainable future. If you haven't read it, please do, please download it. Luca again should be sharing the link in the chat box shortly. Today we're connecting between the immersive gaming and geospatial communities and it's been great to engage with my colleague Asher Easton who runs Immerse UK and partners for this event, the Enterprise N3 Lab who both are experts in their domains and, and, and have helped bring together today's agenda. Immerse UK is KTN's cross-sector network for business, research and educational organisations across the UK that are interested in immersive tech. It's an excellent network to join and get a better understanding of the state of the art in this area. And you can sign up to join the directory, showcase your work, submit news and press releases and find collaborators. And we'll provide a link to that as well. Geospatial data has proven to be beneficial across lots of industries and it's been used in many applications, including identifying communication gaps, humanitarian relief, cost saving and insurance. New technology and capabilities making geospatial data more accessible, easier to understand, gain insight from and interact with. And those technologies include immersive and gaming. But how are companies using immersive and gaming technologies to get insight from geospatial data? How does it work? Is it a nice to have or is it enhancing decision making? We're going to be hearing from some excellent speakers and panelists today, companies at the forefront of their field, showcasing great uses of the tech um, and its impact on geospatial data and solutions. In the first session, the panelists will explore the state of the art with some great examples of applications of augmented and virtual reality in gaming in the geospatial sector. And this will be chaired by my, uh, my colleague, Asha Easton. The second panel phone focuses on regional excellence, showcasing some key companies from the region who have capabilities in either geospatial, immersive or gaming. And it's been fantastic to work with the Enterprise N3 team on this event, particular thanks to Francesca Caramel and Sam Reed for your help on this. So on this subject, I'll now hand over to Rob Dunford, Director of Enterprise N3 Business Delivery Team, who will introduce the region and its strengths. Over to you, Rob. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be here to briefly introduce Enterprise M3's um, exciting agenda in the space, games and immersive tech sectors and the potential for crossovers and partnership building in the coming months. 
For those of you who may not know who we are, what a LEP is, um, the Enterprise M3 LEP spans the M3 corridor from Romsey, just north of Southampton, up to Spelthorne, just southwest of London. And the area contains major towns, including Basingstoke, Guildford, Winchester, Farnborough, Woking and Staines, many of which have got strong um, sectors in immersive tech and space. Um, the, the area comprises one and a half million people, um, roughly a third of which live in rural areas. And the GVA of the area is, is estimated to be just over 50 billion pounds in, in 2019. So we, we are an economic powerhouse within, within the UK and, and the wider Southeast. LEPs are government funded and business led. Our, our board comprises a number of highly regarded experts in a range of sectors who work at senior levels within the business community and set our strategy. Our operational role focuses on gathering evidence, creating economic growth or recovery strategies and convening partners such as businesses and local authorities in order to develop the right ecosystem in which businesses can thrive and grow. We fund the successful growth hub, which provides expert advice to startups and SMEs who want to scale or grow. And we also have a team of careers experts working with schools and colleges to create better links with employers, particularly in our priority growth sectors. In response to COVID, we've developed a revive and renew and skills action plan, which has identified a small number of focused priorities to help the area recover, as well as creating an ambitious new framework for training and job opportunities. With new opportunities to reskill, those who have lost their jobs during the pandemic will need the chance to develop a new a path to a new career and we're keen to ensure people have access to continued and ever better training in high tech areas, again, with a focus on our priority sectors. These priority sectors are games, immersive tech, space and animal health. Um, they have remained strong or relatively strong over the course of the pandemic, and they will offer significant opportunities to grow during the recovery. EM3 is the only LEP in, um, in the UK to lead a successful bid for a £70,000 grant from the UK Space Agency to further develop and formalize our space cluster. And that's working with a fantastic consortium of space organizations in, in and around our patch, many of whom are here today and some of the, our colleagues are on the panel. We've already seen companies such as internationally renowned Nanoavionics and ISI moving to our Basingview Enterprise Zone and Whitehill and Borden respectively. And we're working hard with the Department for International Trade to attract more foreign interest in investing in the area. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, the LEP has worked really hard with partners in Guildford's games sector this year to launch the Guildford.Games website and run the most successful Guildford Games Festival to date, albeit virtually and featuring on Steam and attracting over 2.7 million viewers and participants from across the world. We're also developing high potential opportunities with, department, uh, with the Department of International Trade in games, immersive tech and animal health. This means our region is at the forefront of, uh, for investment opportunities in 187 embassies around the world. That's why this event is so important to us. It aligns with the government's industrial investment strategy, and it's another opportunity to develop our relationships with businesses to identify new ways of working across sectors and to help our region recover strongly from the pandemic. This cross-sector event is the first of its kind for us at EM3, um, and we're really grateful to the, our partners at KTN and Immerse UK for, for helping uh, um, or for leading on this event, and we hope that there will be many more. We're exploring ways in which cross-sector collaboration can be further enhanced, particularly in the context of skills, and we hope to have a dedicated skills workshop combining both space and immersive tech in the near future. This will aim to provide us with even greater evidence on how businesses can work cross-sector and also identify skills gaps, recruitment trends, and how to access a pool of talent which has an enviable reputation across the UK. Thank you for your time this morning, and I do hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Lovely. Thank you, Rob, and congratulations on the, uh, on the award from the UK Space Agency. Thank um, you. I'd, I'd now like to introduce our first speaker for today, Alistair McLennan from Quarry 111. Alistair has worked with the geo industry since founding the European ER Mapper office in the mid 90s, before becoming a member of Dataview Solutions Management team that sold the company to Scient. Um, in 2004, Alistair founded uh, his specialist business development agency, Quarry 111, to provide all geo based companies and organisations with the branding, sales promotion, and marketing skills they so often lack. For the last five years, Alistair has written on location column for GeoConnection magazine where he explores all aspects of geo-product data and services and how they interact with other industries. 
So in many of these articles, Al Alistair has described his belief that gaming technology could provide what could hold a key to making Earth observation and other geotechnologies more accessible to a wider audience. And it's through these articles that I first started interacting with Alistair. So it's great to have you on board today. Alistair is also a resident of the Enterprise M3 region, so a perfect fit. So over to you, Alistair, to, to do your presentation. Great stuff. Uh, thanks so much, Andy and Rob. Uh, and very kind of you to in invite me along. It's, uh, believe you me, I would much prefer to be standing in front of all of you uh, on a stage, and we were all in the same place, but fingers crossed this time next year, we'll be doing exactly that uh, back to normal as always. Um, Andy's introduction was uh, fantastic. In fact, I may cut it out of the recording. It's very kind of him uh, to go through all of that. But um, uh, just to, oh, hang on. Uh, there we go. Just to uh, recap, um, I, I do now run a company called uh, Quarry 111, but uh, I have been writing these columns for the last oh, N number of years. And um, over the last, I think the one in the middle, Get Them Hooked, was uh, the one that uh, when I first started to look at uh, the Fortnite business model and uh, the way that uh, a product that was given away for free, made available for free, that you could play for free, and um, even the technology behind it was given away for free, although you'd have to read the small print uh, uh, quite closely on that one. But um, uh, And yet it was turning over something like $100 million a month. Um, it was also uh, quite, a, quite an addiction in this household, I can tell you that for nothing. Um, but I've also explored um, various other aspects, and, and the more I explore, the more interesting it becomes to me, the more uh, I see how gaming um, technology uh, is an incredible uh, pathway, I think, that you could say, um, to expanding the use of geotech, uh, geo uh, technology, whatever that term means. Um, and I think there's a reason for uh, the combination of the two um, is, is happening more and more, is that change has happened in both of these uh, industries. And the change has happened because barriers have been removed. Uh, and I'll, I'll go on to explain quickly. Uh, I've got far too many slides, so I'll be talking uh, extremely quickly. And again, if I miss anything, please feel free to ask me questions afterwards. But uh, um, the changes in certainly in the industry that I uh, have worked in, the um, Earth observation uh, world, which is a terrible term, realistically, taking pictures from space is a, of the planets um, is a much better description, but because we're a technical uh, industry, we like to hide behind these uh, overly complicated. Um, we also, as you see from this um, uh, screen grab from an article in 1996, like to put far too many columns into, into magazine articles as well, which is really rather peculiar, especially when you're dealing with an in, um, industry that uses incredibly long words. Uh, but I did take a couple of things from this article from uh, way back when, when I started, um, and it was this uh, sentence that uh, government domination of Earth observation satellite systems is coming to an end and the private sector is taking the initiative, which we all thought was fantastic. Um, and it's only 20 years later that we discover it wasn't true, but it is now. And that's really exciting. I think that's when you see, I mean, uh, serendipitously, uh, SpaceX uh, test yesterday ended spectacularly. But that's the private sector, and it's happening everywhere across the space uh, industry. We um, and one of the reasons for that, uh, that was also foreseen in 1996, is that the, the cost barrier to entering uh, this industry is coming down at a rate of knots. Now, in 96, they thought it was fantastic that it had come down from a billion dollars to a hundred million dollars. Well. I'd love to know what the uh, authors of that uh, particular article think to today's uh, cost barrier or uh, entry to the industry. Only last year that uh, NASA and um, uh, researchers put um, $100 satellites into space. It's, now I've gone to the extreme to make my point, but uh, $100 satellites, they, were, they didn't do much, if, I, if I'm honest. Uh, they communicated with each other and they communicated with us. But it makes the point. And these days, uh, CubeSats, NanoSats can get into space. I mean, you can create these things in thousands of dollars, which is amazing when you think about only 20 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, I'm slightly older than I uh, like to admit, but um, the there was a billion dollars of investment to get uh, some of these satellites into space. And the effect of this uh, reduction, the loss of these barriers results in quite the change. And this is a fantastic representation of what currently whirls around above us. And each of those satellites 
to be fair, some of that is is debris. Some of that is uh, problematic, and and indeed there are people much cleverer than I uh, involved in uh, in getting rid of that. But um, those satellites there are looking down at us. They're communicating. They're uh, looking at the atmosphere. They hold the key. They really do hold the key, the Rosetta Stone, if you like, for decrypting what we're going to do next. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges to this planet, uh, living on this planet, and there will be going forwards. And I've always believed, I've always thought the remote sensing Earth observation data will be one of the keys um, to solving those problems. But we really need to get that data into the hands of as many people as possible, as many people that we, we possibly have never thought should have it. But I, you know, I think if you do get it into the hands of people, then, then great things can happen. And again, you can see where I'm going with that, because gaming technology is one way of doing that. So what's changed in the gaming industry? Well, it might be a bit peculiar to try and highlight that with beer, uh, but I find that works with uh, many subjects. Um, but Bud, Budweiser have been pouring, uh, uh, sorry, forgive that pun, uh, have been uh, sinking a lot of uh, money and time into esports. Um, this is one of their uh, promotions working with uh, Fanatic, an organization based in London who represent professional esports players, just in case uh, you thought it was still for kids. And the reason that they're doing that is that they know that the people who use gaming, uh, who consume games, has changed completely. If you have the stereotype that it's uh, kids in their basement, well, this proves it's wrong because there's no way an organization would uh, spend so much money if their intended marketplace couldn't buy their product. So as you see, obviously, uh, beer sales are restricted by age. It goes one stage further, actually, when, when I was researching uh, one of the uh, articles I wrote recently, I came across this fantastic, uh, and I encourage you to go and have a look at it if you haven't already seen it. Activision and Blizzard Media did a seminar where, where they um, surveyed uh, a, a significant number of uh, mothers with, with at least one child under the age of 18 at home, uh, between, uh, and the mothers were between the ages of 25 and I think 52, apologies if I got that wrong, 71% of them said they played video games. And this, I think whoever you are, is vaguely surprising. It certainly was to me, because I had those stereotypes in my head. I had that uh, that the people who play games wouldn't be, wouldn't cut across these kind of demographics, but they do. And that highlights why so many uh, other brands are beginning now to understand that uh, and beginning to understand that uh, if you want to reach people, you have to go through a channel that they like and understand. And one, uh, I think this story is pretty well known, but I, I couldn't help but bring it up. It's fantastic uh, use of the marketing and, and the technology that uh, Burger King, for those who don't know Stevenage uh, Football Club, which is probably everyone who doesn't support Stevenage Football Club, um, they are in the lowest tier of our uh, football leagues. Burger King sponsored them, um, and that's not going to sell a, a, a lot more burgers, um, given their home gate. But if you link up with uh, FIFA, I think it's probably 19, it might have been FIFA 20, um, you go into the careers mode and you start to uh, align your marketing with giving away burgers, giving away reductions, with people posting their best goals wearing your kit. Eventually, you end up with, who's that, Pogba, Mbappe, uh, Messi and Neymar wearing your shirt. Now, Burger King have got a marketing budget. I don't think they've got one that would extend uh, to that, them wearing that in for real. And that's a fantastic use of the technology in terms of how to reach and how to take a pro another product that has nothing to do really with online gaming and to combine the two. And something I think the geo industry could learn a lot from because where these commercial products lead, B2B products often follow and, and the good ones certainly should. And so if we remove more barriers, if we, if we continue to remove these barriers, we'll continue to include more people in our industry. And of course, that's why gaming is uh, so interesting, I think, to, to, to us and should be of interest, great interest to us. And when you include more people, great things can happen if you include enough of them. I'm sure everybody uh, in the geo world will know what this is, uh, just in case from the gaming community doesn't. Um, when enough people get together, and enough people understand uh, the technology, the benefits of the technology, and there is no barrier to contributing to that technology, you can map the world. The OpenStreetMap did just that. And to give you an idea, uh, this is uh, one of the universities in downtown Libreville in the Gabon. Nobody's got this kind of mapping of, uh, I mean, you can see where the library is, you can see where individual departments are. And that's because 
the students at the university decided they wanted to get involved and they uh, produced this map this incredible map and honestly again after the after this if you haven't explored the open street map go and do it it's it's a fascinating uh, example of where enough people get together to affect incredible change but products can do the same and they um, have done in the past this is the iphone 12 uh, the pro and the pro max uh, that were released a month ago maybe slightly less um, and these machines have already affected great change in the uh, geospatial world you uh, you will have seen that from the uh, the use of gps Nobody has had GPS explained to them. Nobody really knows how the, the iPhone works, but that doesn't stop people wanting them, using them every day because they make their lives better. And so everybody uh, now is a GPS user and we have an incredible um, community of users of GPS. They may just not know that. And I think that's the key uh, to expanding any technical industry. If you can get it used, uh, by people that they don't know they're using it, but they know that it's useful, then, then you're making great progress. And I think it's something the geo community should learn. But I think they are. Um, and over the last two years, I've seen some fantastic leaps forward. The most exciting leap forward about the thing you see in front of you is, are those scanners, which are LIDAR scanners. And now LIDAR, for people that uh, have never heard of it, uses lasers to create what's known as a 3D point cloud or a representation of a, of a uh, physical world. It's a fantastic, if not slightly niche piece of uh, technology, which is being used more and more in autonomous cars and various other things. But it's um, now just it gained some 50 million new users, 100 million new users. They don't know it's LiDAR. I mean, Apple say that in their, in their blurb, but actually they're calling it depth technology or the ability to see in the dark because you know, Apple are quite good at marketing. And it's a fantastic piece of kit. It's a fantastic development for our um, industry. And uh, if I, again, my last uh, shout out, and I'm probably uh, running over time because I tend to, and I try and say too much in too short a space of time. But in, uh, afterwards, go on Twitter, uh, look up Ruben. Uh, he's a fantastic um, uh, developer, fantastic use of, uh, uh, of, of geospatial work and, um, and, and video and, and various things that can, and gaming technology. Uh, this is uh, Ruben's front room in Japan, where he lives. Um, and well, that's not wildly exciting. Uh, but this is also Ruben's front room uh, when he took a 3D scan using his iPhone 12 and then rendered it using Minecraft or uh, to make it look like Minecraft. Now, I bring this up because, and there you go, there's the original point cloud um, and back to Minecraft to, to explore. Now, I showed this to my 10 year old daughter last night. And I never said a word she, before she said, oh, it's Minecraft. It's very colorful, Minecraft. That's interesting. What's that? We then had a five minute conversation about LIDAR. I don't think it's the most fascinating conversation she's ever had, but imagine it the other way around. Imagine if I'd have started with, let's have a five minute conversation about LIDAR. It would have gone nowhere because there's no understanding of what that technology is or could be. But because we had it in Minecraft, we had that chat for about five minutes. And that was exciting. It suddenly, it certainly proves and opens my eyes to the, the possibilities of presenting these things, these incredibly complicated technologies in a simple way and in a way that people like uh, to consume information. So I'll leave you with one slide and I apologize to the organizers if I've gone over my time, but if we can continue to remove barriers, more people will use what we do in the geo world. And if we remove all of the barriers, to include everybody, then I be really believe we can probably change everything. So thank you very much for listening. Anyone wants to get in touch, obviously there's my email address and I believe uh, I'm available for the panel uh, to answer any further questions. Lovely, thank you very much Alistair for that great introduction. I think removing all barriers is a, is a great message there. Um, and yes, uh, Alistair will be joining the panel. So if you've got any questions for him, please use the Q&A box and we'll get those highlighted. So now straight over to Asha, um, my colleague Asha from Immerse UK, who will be introducing the first panel of the day. Thank you very much, Asha. Great, thanks, Andy. 
All right, everyone, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to be discussing now um, examples of applications of um, AR and VR and gaming in the geospatial sector. Um, we're going to be talking broadly about how these technologies are intersecting and where there are opportunities for consumer and enterprise applications. Um, I'm joined today by Ed Parsons, a geospatial technologist from Google, Linda Wade, the CEO of SpinView, uh, Melanie Langlotz, the CEO of GeoAR Games, and we're also going to have Alistair uh, <laughs> jumping in on, on this panel as well. Um, I'm going to give each speaker um, five minutes to just introduce themselves and their work, um, and then uh, we're going to go straight into a discussion and Q&A. If you have any questions, um, just drop them in the Q&A box, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. So, Ed, I'll let you start off with your presentation. Asha, good morning. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess good day, which is the term that we all need to use on these video calls because we don't know necessarily where everyone is. Um, I'm going to kick off very quickly, I hope, in the next sort of few minutes, uh, just with a few pictures to give you some sense of, of um, I think, what we're talking about, uh, at least from a Google perspective. Uh, hopefully you can see my uh, slides. Um, yep. Things never necessarily work always the way you expect them to. Very quickly, why is Google interested in geography, yeah. geospatial technology? Because fundamentally, geospatial technology um, is a way of organizing the world's information, which is Google's job. And, and that's what we do. So behind the scenes in many of our products and services, geospatial technology uh, is used. It's obvious in things like Google Maps and Google Earth, but actually um, it goes across the board across many of our different uh, technologies. A fundamental core way that we work at, at Google is to try to uh, follow this, this principle. If we focus on the user, everything else then follows. Um, that user focus is easy to talk about sometimes, but actually it, it takes quite a lot of science and effort to, to really understand what a, a user's needs and requirements are. When we talk about uh, Google's, uh, I suppose, experiments uh, view of gaming technology, the user community is slightly different. Our focus, at least at the moment, is on these people, actually on developers rather than, than end users. We're looking at how can we take our technology platform, make it available to computer uh, games creators, developers, and allow them to, to make use of the, the, the functionality, the capability, the data sets that we have created to support uh, Google's geospatial technology uh, over the last decade or so. And there are really two ways of doing that. One is to place the world in your game. So to take, um, to use the, the, uh, the popular term uh, at, at the moment, the digital twin of the world that, that Google uses to, to power Google Maps and put that into your, into your games or into your user experience. And the other one is to then place your game in the world, i.e. how can you bring your gamers and put them into the world that they know then they can go and explore to so get them outside of their, their bedrooms. And I know obviously that uh, that archetype isn't, isn't true, but nevertheless, get people out of their homes running around and exploring the world while playing games. So those are the two focuses. Let's look at those very, very quickly. Uh, first, placing the world in your game is something that we've been trying to do for quite a long time. I guess the poster child for this in many ways was Getaway, the game developed back in, in 2002, uh, which put you uh, in central London, a gangster driving around a relatively small part of London, but relatively well detailed and was quite immersive for its time. Uh, clearly what's been most interesting, I guess, in the, the decades since then is developing that at a larger scale. Even things like Google Earth, uh, which started, I guess, the process of creating a digital twin from a geospatial point of view in a very accessible sense, actually had a flight simulator built in, and it still has a flight simulator built in from the very early days. So we can take that digital twin, that data set of Google Earth, and make it available in a user interface that looks like a flight simulator. It's very simple, um, but it's, I think, something that's been there and actually represents now in an increasingly emerging field. I think everyone probably is going to be familiar with the new version of Microsoft Flight Simulator that was released uh, over this summer. It certainly as, a, as a, an aviator myself has kept me occupied uh, since the summer when I've not been able to go flying. I can go flying and experience the world in very high resolution. 
uh, using the same sorts of geospatial technology that sits in, in Google Earth. Here, though, uh, something created by, by uh, Microsoft and Bing's technology. But it gives you that immersive sense of flying around the world, exploring real world geography in real time with real weather, flight dynamics that are very accurate. It's as close as you can get to flying a, an aircraft sitting in front of your computer. So concretely, what are we doing at Google to make this sort of put your world in the game technology available? Well, we have a, a Maps API, a, a, a platform um, programming interface that allows you to put Google Maps content into your games, particularly if you're using something like the Unity Gaming Engine. And then for the big game, we have uh, a playable locations API, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So in a simple sense, if you wanted to say, for example, play Pac-Man, uh, not in some you know, random geometric gaming uh, space, but actually in your local neighborhood, you could use that technology to bring Pac-Man into your local space. So here I am uh, playing Pac-Man in my local neighborhood in Teddington, taking Google Maps underlying mapping technology and using that uh, to create a, a, a gaming space. Uh, and this is something that we uh, developed uh, in the last year or so with Nameco, who are the owners of the, the Pac-Man franchise. That other element that is perhaps less well-known or less obvious to people, but nevertheless, I think is, is something that will emerge uh, is the idea of putting uh, your game into the world, big games, actually going out and experiencing the world playing games when you're out of the home based on mobile technology. I'm not sure how many people remember Gizmodo. Uh, this was a, a gaming platform that was developed back in 2005. It was one of the first uh, examples of actually a handheld GPS based device you can take out with you, but in this case dedicated for, for gaming. It was never a great success. Uh, there was a game that was created that was meant to be part of this big uh, leap forward in technology it was never really released. <clears throat> this sounds like the, the pitch for a Hollywood movie. <clears throat> it was quite close to the pitch for a Hollywood movie. One of the founders of Gizmodo, a uh, Swedish gentleman, um, uh, Stefan Eriksson, spent all of the money, ended up crashing his Ferrari. It was, a, it was a big story at the time, never really took off, maybe a little bit too early. The big game that everyone talks about was Pokemon Go produced by Niantic, an offshoot of, of Google. Uh, these guys took the Pokemon Go franchise, put it into the real world, allowed you to play a game on your mobile phone that was based on underlying geographic information. You went to gyms and played games. And this really introduced, I think, mobile gaming and big games concept to a whole new audience. This was a massive success very, very quickly. And you do still see people suddenly emerging out of seemingly nowhere, all congregating in a particular geographical area to play a particular part of the game. This is something that is still quite difficult to achieve from a technological point of view. It's very much driven by the data that sits behind it, but also the, the, the social elements of getting a community together that wants to play the game. But we've tried to make those underlying pieces of technology available to people uh, particularly important or particularly valuable at this point in time is is the Dragon Quest franchise, very popular in Japan. Dragon Quest Walk is an example of being able to play Dragon Quest in, in the streets of Tokyo or any other Japanese city using this fundamental under, underlying geospatial technology in the same way. So that was a very quick run through uh, some of the, the thoughts that we're having. We we play a role, I guess, as a as a fundamental technology uh, provider here, not building games ourselves, helping the ecosystem develop, but recognizing actually that the same fundamental geospatial technology is really valuable to the, to the gaming industry. Our, our task is to make it accessible in, in the same way that Alistair pointed out. It's about removing those barriers. Um, and many of those barriers are, are ones you know, in our own, own minds, just thinking about the possibilities here. Now, for many people in the geospatial industry, it's a very traditional, it's a very conservative industry. Sometimes it takes that leap of thinking for us to be involved in, in what many people perceive to be um, a, a, a relatively simple industry. But of course, as Alistair has pointed out, it's huge. It's a massive success for, for the UK 
and we need to be more uh, deeply involved in it. Okay, I'm looking forward to the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for that, Ed. So now we're gonna have Linda Wade from SpinView, um, who's gonna give a bit more of an enterprise perspective. Um, really great to be here, thank you. I'm the CEO of SpinView, and we're looking at how we can take all of this geospatial information and actually use and leverage it for your workplace. And one of the points that Ed was making just now is the world is full of data. And while Google are helping everybody sort and manage the data, one of the big barriers to using that information is that it sits in silos. Lots of people don't really understand how to use it, don't can't access it, and it's all over the place. One of the big things that we're looking to do at SpinView is see how this we can use the power of vision. You know, we're, we're visual human creatures. We are 90 plus percent of all of our communications as humans is through vision. And if we can combine vision with the geospatial data, put the data in the world or understand where the data is in the world around us, and then use vision to be able to communicate that, all of a sudden it changes our understanding. It changes the way that we can start by capturing the information and then by communicating it. And here is just a small example of the whole world, your whole street is full of information from the white lines, the potholes, the cars, the lampposts, everything around you contains an element of information. And LiDAR scanners and all of these types of things can make that information accessible, but then we need to communicate it. And so I'm gonna just show you an example of how this type of information can be captured around us. And this is an area that was used. This is in Sweden. We were capturing train depots. They wanted to be able to capture the train tracks, the terrain, the depot itself. Where were the pipes underground? Where were the pipes on the ground level? Where did everything sit in relation to itself? The only way of actually really understanding all of that information was to use all the different types of data capture that you can get, so the LiDAR scanners and volumetric capture, and all of these types of imagery, point clouds, lots and lots of data sources. And then by fusing all of that information together, <laughs> got to love a dog in the background, um, by fusing all that information together and putting it through vision, so virtual reality or augmented reality, we can put the information where people need it and when. One of the most complex things is the um, ability to merge and fuse all the data sets. And this has been one of the big stumbling blocks that a lot of organizations have had. And we found a way of combining together all of this data and putting it so that you can see what's underground, what's on ground level and what's above ground, either inside or outside, and being able to display it in a way that then changes the way that we work. Now imagine if I can, you know, like you can in a car where you get your overhead display units where you can see projected onto the ground your speed that you're traveling. You don't know it's augmented reality. It's how it happens is not really important to you. You just know that's how fast you're traveling. Well, when you have all the data that we're kind of showing in these environments and we can put it where you need it for your workspace, it changes everything. It makes people more efficient. And the whole aim behind all of these technologies is to empower the end users to be more efficient, have the data where you need it and when you need it. Uh, moving on from that, if you can make it as simple as all those dots of information, every single one of those, which can seem quite overwhelming and complex, and make it as simple as red or green, highlighted on a map, Sorry, I'm just wrong screen sharing. You can take all that data that we kind of were showing just now and highlight using the same sort of Google mapping techniques that we're already really familiar with and show red, there is a problem here. You can go geographically in space to the information that's there, do visual inspections without the need of ever having to go to that area of road you can find out what is wrong with that area of road because the information that you can capture is detailed. It's, was there oil in the road? Was there a pothole? Was there rutting? Is there a tree falling down? Is the white line correct? And if you start to combine this as well with machine learning, instead of humans having to go and do the traditional things, which are really time consuming and really costly, we used to have to walk the road. 
now we're actually able to let the machines do all of that for us and highlight where all the key problems are. We can start to go and experience where all the data is and we can see it really simply and really easy through red or green. And so geospatial technologies are really helping us transform the way that we communicate as people, the way that we communicate between ourselves and the way that businesses can operate. And what we're finding is you can get cost savings of up to 66% just by letting the machines take and capture the information and give it to your employees in a way that they can understand, red or green, and be able to communicate it out. And the cost saving as well on the bottom line is in excess of 20 plus percent in terms of helping you communicate to be able to increase your sales. These are really significant numbers. When you consider that the bad data costs over three trillion in the US alone a year, this is phenomenal sums of money that can be achieved just through leveraging geospatial information, but portraying it in a simple to use format through immersive technology. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda, that was excellent. Um, next up we have Mel. Mel Langlotz, do you wanna jump yep. in? Hi, hi from New Zealand. Okay, so I'm going to play a video in the background, which basically showcases our work. But at the same time, I want to tell you a little bit about what we do. So we've been around for five years. Um, our main clients are in Australia, and we're now starting to move into the US. And we started out developing digital playgrounds. In actual fact, we came out before Pokemon Go. But because we released in New Zealand and Australia, nobody in the rest of the world knows about that. Um, we basically turn boring parks into exciting digital playgrounds that have kids running around in a safe space. It's geofenced. And together with the councils and the cities, we developed a safety mechanism that keeps the kids within the within a specific area in the park. The games are educational. They take government messages um, that they want to, to educate the community with, like for instance, climate change or recycling. And we use that and we gamify it. And so we work together with the councils to get messages out to the community. And we use the kids to learn the messages and then pass it on to the parents. So it's quite a nice way to educate and to teach the, the kids and have them exercise. The schools absolutely love it. Communities really love it. Um, yeah, and we're now going into the US, US with, with that. So I'm quite excited about that. So that's been around for a while. Um, what that actually did is it became our flagship and as we carried on, we had more and more cities and councils around the world loving what we're doing and coming back to us and asking, could you use that principle that you've done and teach something else? And, um, and so that really opened the doors for us. So here you kind of like, you know, see climate change, but um, what, for instance, if it was something else? So the next app that it's going to jump into in a couple of seconds is a um, disaster management app. So that's the next bit that's popping up now. So this is what's the plan stand. It was developed together with the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, the um, Ministry of Health, the Civil, Civil Defence Council from Auckland, and the Earthquake Commission of New Zealand. So a hell of a lot of New Zealand um, government departments. And as you can see, New Zealand is very active, right? We've got earthquakes, we've got volcanoes, we've got, you know, the lot, everything. And so we decided that the kids need to learn how to be prepared in disaster scenarios. And we wanted to teach them actions that are within their power. That was really key to us. So we designed this game over um, quite a long time together with all these civil defense people. And um, to to get them really to understand, to get the kids to understand what needs to go into an emergency box. Uh, what do you do if there's a tsunami? What do you do if there's a volcanic eruption? What's the difference? You know, one is getting to higher ground, one is to evacuate. And then actually helping the parents to understand that as well, because believe it or not, a lot of families in New Zealand do not have an emergency box, but should do. So the kids then went home and said, mom, have, do we have one? This one is our TS stories. It was funded by the government and it is the first adult game that we've developed, which teaches history. You can see we're using AR core, but not only that, we're using uh, motion capture. And so we've had real artists and real actors who were dressed up 
and who are telling the history of Auckland and in, in using four really old buildings that used to be there in the 19th century. And um, the game is quite groundbreaking for us because it gets us into a new area. And then this one is my favorite. So the city of Canning in Australia asked us to develop a game to help teach their community the importance of water quality to protect the wetland the city was setting up. Canning just got commended in the Future of Places Award section for the app we developed for them. And what's exciting about the app is that we made an invisible app visible through the signs you can see. And that we incorporated live data from the water and climate sensors in the game, which can, you just could see there. And so we make the player an environmental scientist around the wetland. And, um, and that is quite unusual for a lot of cities trying to teach environmental climate change through that. Now, then we took the app and we wanted to see how fast can we recycle that into something else. And so what you see here was two days of work taking the app you just saw and recycling it into a Christmas app. So here you're just seeing two games, but basically what it is about is just, you know, yeah, recycling apps and um, just a completely different type of business model really for us. And I think that's my five minutes. And sorry, I'm actually not available for meetings later on, but please do feel free to email me and I'll jump on, on any meetings after that. But because I'm in New Zealand, um, it'll be in the middle of the night. Thank you so much, Mel. So I'll invite everyone back, Linda, Ed, Alistair, <laughs> to have a chat. We have limited time, so I'm just gonna like dive right in. And if you have any more questions, guys, put them in the Q and A. Um, I want to start off like before my first question, just with a quote that I, I read from one of Alistair's articles, which said, gamification has fallen out of favor since its heyday of a few years ago for many reasons I understand and agree with, but I believe that it might just do for the geospatial industry what the smartphone did for GPS, making a wildly complicated application accessible and useful to most people. I found that really interesting. And I want to kind of start the questions by asking you, how do you all see the intersection of geospatial immersive and gaming technology evolving in the next three to five years? And where are the biggest opportunities? It's a big one. <laughs> I'm going to say, you, you, you start with the easy questions. Um, I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 I want to get the good stuff. <laughs> I, uh, um, I, I do think, um, just to, to sort of warm to my theme of barriers, I, I, I really do think the, the iPhone, sorry, the iPhone, the, the, the smartphone, um, did that to GPS for sure. It, there's no question about it. It puts uh, incredible technology in the hands of everybody. And certainly when you're talking about remote sensing, um, it, it worries me that we, we still don't quite learn that message and that, uh, that's why I'm so excited about gaming. But, um, and I thought that the three speakers highlighted that perfectly with, with uh, the, the technology that's coming along. And, and why I'm such a fanboy, I think of Melanie's uh, company at the moment is that it really, it really just, um, it accepts the digital native it accepts that kids you know, really can't walk around without a phone in their hand and, and it really just uh says okay if that's the real world that's the situation how do we talk to them and we talk to them in their language and you know what they're doing is is thrilling to me i, I just I, I really really like that capability now it's it's aimed at kids and uh, and linda's um, aimed at um, other businesses but they're even there she's She's doing it really uh, in a way that people, you know, that's how people look down the road. That's how people see information. That's how they consume it. So replicate that and make it as simple as possible to, to take on board this incredible amount of information. And um, you know, and Google have already organized all of the information. So that, that's well done, Ed. Thanks for that. That's very kind of you. My pleasure. Um, I, I just thrilled with the three presentations. I, I, they just uh, reinforce uh, currently for me what, what, what I've been writing and saying. I mean, I, th I think this will be quite organic, and, and I think you know it will it will develop where the innovation happens. I think you've got that fundamental platform now of of this this model of the world that we can we can use in different ways, and I think it will go in different directions. I think, as Alistair says, the mobile uh, gaming um, route is is huge, is massive, is going to grow almost exponentially uh, because it, it is just so accessible, and it's something that. You know, we can play a, a game in five minutes. We're in the queue, in the queue at the post office, and and because the device is there, and because the device knows where it is. But I think there's also a, a, a trend that will emerge that's much deeper. It's much more to do with virtual reality, uh, and and perhaps you know much more detailed, more sophisticated games that 
that make use of those incredibly powerful machines now that we all have in our homes, both in terms of compute capability, but also the ability to access all of that content that sits in the cloud um, and you know, high resolution screens, virtual reality will eventually come and become a much bigger part of, of gaming. So I see it going in those two directions. One very simple, very you know, game oriented around your mobile device and the other one, the much more immersive driven by simulation driven by that digital twin data set that we now have uh, easily accessible to ourselves i feel like that kind of ties in too with linda with your with your um solution because you have like a really robust uh you know desktop solution but also the vr side of it which is you know you have multi multi-platform options yeah we do so everything that we create is usable on desktop and mobile because that's the, the systems that we're used to as humans already. Um, moving into VR, a lot of people are afraid because it's quite a closed space. As the technology comes over the next couple of years, which will allow you a combination of the VR where you go into those remote worlds and AR where you're putting information into the real world, that XR space will, will be when this really, really game changes, you know, like the Google Glass type of scenario, being able to wear spectacles and actually immerse yourself somewhere else or share a vision. I mean, we have, um, you know, people that say, for example, on board their employees, their factories are in Eastern Europe, their, their offices are in New York, and they're onboarding employees remotely by doing walk rounds of factories. They don't need to be there. You know, you're, you're pre-onboarding employees in uh, fisheries, um, so that they're not overwhelmed by the sites and things before they before they go on site. But when you are there, all the health and safety information, everything you need, the data about the machines, the performance can be overlaid where you need it. And it's, it's going to be partly just the increase in this software and the accessibility of this software for people. But also if we can get the hardware to play catch up, you know, as the devices become lighter, simpler, just like wearing a pair of shades, we're going to be able to do a lot more by overlaying it any information where you need it. Nice. I'm getting tons of questions in the Q&A, so I want to ask one to Mel that it kind of ties into that, which asks, um, are you purely app-based or have you tried web AR yet? No. Um, we do do web AR games, but mainly because some of our players are not as wealthy or, um, yeah, they're just not in that space that they can afford to have mobile phones, let's face it. We do have some very low socioeconomic um, families here in New Zealand. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is very community driven. And so we try and focus on what does the community have? And something else that I wanna just kind of point out here is that, for instance, with the canning example that I showed, we talked to them and said, what devices does your community use? Because anyone in tech would always like to use the latest and greatest, but they see to us, quite frankly, most of them have an iPhone 5. So we build for an iPhone 5. Mm. And that is something that I feel a lot of people in tech forget that the community actually, it's great if you know the phones have got LiDAR and I love LiDAR. But fact is, most of the users have got no access to those devices because they just can't simply afford it. And so they're cut out and they're cut out of a lot of education as well. Yeah. And it was also, uh, I mean, you have an interesting business model you developed with the councils as well, right? To make it more accessible to even build the content, right? Yeah. So basically, we're very aware that um, a lot of cities around the world don't have the funds, they're in debt. And um, we also became aware of the silos between different councils and inside councils. And as a, re as a result, what we came up with was, okay, so you want to have all the cool stuff and you can't really pay for it. Well, then what that means is you have to share. So we created a crowdsourced application between cities and councils. So if a city comes to me and says, we would like to have what you've done there, I can say, absolutely, we built that for you and you will have to share it. You will have to share it with everybody around the world. And that's how it works. So we came up with a subscription model that cities around the world can afford. They're quite surprised when they hear our prices, but that is because they have to share it. It's not exclusive. If you want, have, want to have exclusive content, then you have to pay for it. And so we are very much into, <laughs> yep, sharing. It's great. Um, we have lots of questions coming in for Google, Ed. Um, there's one asking, um, how do developers ask, uh, access the underlying Google tech? Does Google have a system for working with small SMEs? Um, and do you, do you have an SDK for Unreal Engine, which is another games engine, if anyone doesn't know? 
no, there's not an official one. People have tried to um, uh, reverse engineer, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone goes in that direction. Um, so no, we don't for a real moment. And the API is is a public API. If you just Google um, Games API or Google Maps Games API, you'll you'll find the details. It's a standard sort of API. Uh, you pay by transactions. You get a huge number of transactions for free to sort of develop your app to see if it works, and then. Uh, if you're successful, hopefully you'll, you'll pay us and we'll share your success. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, so, because someone here also asked if they could use it, um, the, if they could use it commercially. So I guess this just has a subscription. Very much so, yeah. Okay. Um, another question here is what are the main characteristics of a good public sector client, uh, like a local government or central government um, that is able to commission the effective use of these kinds of capabilities for enhancing public ser services? I guess that could be Mel or Linda. I mean, Linda, I'm sure you work with cities as well, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, I think a lot of the problems are, are the red tape in government. Um, but yes, if it's to be deployed at its most effective, having instead of, um, you know, I think Mel was mentioning some of those around the, the data silos, having one complete picture of what is going on in the world around you is game changing. You've got all the information in one source, you get all the information coming in that can be transformed into one simple to use output you can actually see what's going on around you. And it, the efficiencies that can be achieved for governments through doing this kind of work is, is game changing. And whether it be that through a sharing platform like Mel's talking about, or whether it's commissioned at the government levels, yeah, it's, it is amazing to be able to do. But you know, you, quite often you just have to start small. And you know, like we've done in Sweden with the example that I was showing there was one train depot and they've started with one and then gradually they do a second and then they do a third because each one comes with its own merits. And then gradually it starts to be an education process. Unfortunately, it's not something that's generally particularly quick, um, particularly at a government level, but the cost savings, particularly in a world at the moment where the, there are so many expenses and so many governments in debt, particularly after this year, you know, it, it is something they should be looking at embracing a lot more quickly because it will save an inordinate amount of money. Mel, do you want to comment on that as well? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of like trying to re re recall the original question, which was like, which was it like, you know, how to come, what's the best way to commission a, a, a government? Yeah, like who, and who's the, what makes yeah. a public sector client, I guess. Yeah, I, I, f I think the, the key thing is, first of all, to understand how they work. So um, yes, there is a tender, but there is also a cutoff line in terms of spending. At what stage do they need to go to a tender? And if you are looking for large contracts, then you will automatically have to become part of a tender. We found a way to go under the radar. So we talk to the council and we say, what's in your kitty? So, you know, what's, what's in your kitchen kitty? What can you get away with without having to go to a board level? And that's what we work with. And um, in, in that case, what's happened for us is that sometimes councils have even asked for an exemption to not have to put out a tender so they could work with us. So we become a vendor for the council after we have proven ourselves. And that's another way to get in with the cities. Great. Um, I have another question here referring to Ed's quote about focusing on the user and everything else will follow. Um, how does the panel see the transition to the user content creation coming? So I guess these are people creating their own content on platforms. I think there's, there's huge potential here. There's been, I suppose, some uh, efforts to try and gamify phone data creation or data content collection from a geospatial point of view. Indeed, you know, there's the Google Maps community. We give you points for doing reviews, for updating Google Maps, for taking photographs, and then we give you free stuff. So we give people you know, Google Home speakers and, and and toys and, and, and chattels in such a way. But I think there's, there's massive potential here because there's a, there's a virtuous circle here. The, the more you play the game, the more you create content that is useful to be part of that game. You see it you know, in the ecosystems that exist around many of the popular games where people can create content, make it available either as, as open source or shareable content or on a commercial basis. And I think there's, there's much excitement in this uh, area and, and it allows indeed, you know, SMEs to start growing quite quickly. If they find their niche, they can create, you know, weapons or they can create you know, aircraft skins or they can create models of particular environments. So there's great opportunity there. It just needs that uh, thought to be 
uh, open or to allow that level of openness in, in your game? Um, there's another question. I'm, I'm kind of running over, but I feel like we were late, so we get more time. Uh, Linda, there's a question for you about um, how you integrate satellite imagery into your product and how is the experience working with space data? Yes, actually, a lot of the data that we've used has actually come from drones or from land or subsurface based um, uh, data capture systems, um, multi-sensor devices. We don't actually really use satellite imagery ourselves. However, we can. Um, it's just around any data stream that comes in, even weather data, anything, can all be fused together and give one output. And so one of the key things that we look at is how can you take all the data from anywhere in the world, however it is, but simply put it in the hands of the person that needs it. So if it's the road data and you can look at the satellite, which will help with the mapping, how do you get the information on the pothole to the person that's going to fix it? And it's how do you take it from something that's this big all the way to the minutiae in a way that the person that's actually doing the work can consume. And so it's, it's through the fusion and then through simple output. But we, can, we, we just take the feeds of information at a very simple level. Yes. Um, there's another good question here asking, with Google, Sysium, ESRI, and Mapbox creating Geodata API to game engine connections, a lot of the focus at the moment is on, is on data rendering and engines. Do we run the risk of game developers missing the importance of spatial analytics and how it could be used within games engines? Ed, Alistair? <laughs> no. that's, a, that's a big question. I, I mean, again, you know, just focus on the users. It, it makes the game better to play uh, then you know the the ability to carry out those kind of analytical tasks behind the scenes is part of it but you know it, it, there's a huge amount of technology that's hidden behind the scenes and even the, the simplest of, of the games that make use of, of this real world content so you know as, as if you focus on the user it makes the game more interesting more exciting then there's a whole bag of tools that we get to play with the danger is that we just try to do things that are too technologically advanced or sophisticated and actually end up with a game that's not particularly enjoyable. Well, what worries me slightly is um, with what's that list is that whenever you, you say, well, what we need is a standard here and 27 people suddenly come out with a standard and, and that then always causes its own problems. And, and suddenly we all get involved in, oh my goodness, we need to come up with a standard for all these standards. And suddenly we've moved away, exactly as Ed was saying, we've moved away from what's important. And there may be a little bit of, um, uh, self-survival in, in these uh, APIs to a certain extent where people, you know, we want to stay relevant, we want to stay ahead. And, and actually, um, the, uh, the open source, was, uh, again, about Melanie's uh, business model is fantastic. The, the idea is if we can share it, if, if more people can get hold of this data, the ecosystem will grow and everybody will, um, everybody will benefit. Uh, and that's the key for me is that we don't we don't get we get away and everyone's used the word silos we get away from that we make the data available as much as we can for free it gets used and then the ecosystem will grow and the money will be made that way i think that's a great point to end off on this is fantastic i'm sure we could talk about this all day and the q a did blow up a little bit so guys if you could uh, maybe answer them type some answers into the q a if they were directed to you that'd be really great but thank you all so much for your time really appreciated it and um if anyone has any questions for the speakers um, i'm sure everyone would be happy for you to follow up with us afterwards right Elena, thank, thank, thank you thank you asha thank you for the panelists that was that was inspiring and it's great to see the enthusiasm for you know, gaming and geospatial the way it's becoming more accessible and the fact that we do walk around with our mobile phones in our hands and the enabling power of the compute capability and the cloud making all these things more possible i can see this being a real opportunity for both the geospatial immersive and gaming sectors going forward so cracking on though um i am going to introduce uh, tom greenwood now um, obviously, a key element of making innovation happen is, is funding. So Tom Greenwood works for the European Space Agency as their regional ambassador for business applications for London and the Southeast. And he's going to give a short presentation on some of the funding opportunities um, from ESA. So go for it, Tom. OK, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Um, my name's Tom, as, as Andy's already mentioned. Uh, I cover the Southeast region for a programme within the European Space Agency called uh, ESA Business Applications. Primarily, we're a funding program. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today, but uh, I'm aware that a lot of people don't have a space background. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little bit of an insight to the sector, particularly in the UK, just to get us going. 
so this is probably one of the most famous photos that's ever been taken. Uh, it's called Earthrise. It was taken in the 1960s as part of the Apollo program. Most people have seen some form of, of this photo at some point in their lives. Um, but the famous strap line that came along with this photo was that we went all the way to the moon and the most significant discovery that we made was the Earth. So this really uh, sort of inspired uh, looking back at the Earth from space to learn more about our planet and uh, inspired the next kind of 50 years of, of Earth observation and satellite launch to, to kind of learn more about our planet that we live on. The space sector itself has gone through four major eras, um, the very earliest being uh, early astronomy, looking up into the stars. Um, but the second era, which is often known as the space race, uh, is, is, is often what most people still think of when we, when we talk about space. So this is uh, the, the kind of race to, to the moon landings, if you like. But since then, there's been a huge amount of innovation in, in, in the space sector. And uh, in the uh, kind of third era, 70s, 80s and 90s, we realized that we can achieve a lot more by working together, um, both as different organizations, different countries. And this is where we see the design, launch and operation of the International Space Station. We see sharing of satellite navigation data across different platforms, satellite broadcasting, and uh, also the, found, the founding of the European Space Agency. We are now in the fourth era, which is very much the commercial era of space. Alistair's already given us some really good insight into that this morning. Um, but there's, there's so many companies out there that are incorporating data into our lives in a way that we don't need to really think about it. And space is a huge, or plays a huge uh, role in this. And the classic example I like to use is um, even your pizza now you can track using GPS all the way from the restaurant right to your front door. So we're really, really in the commercial era of space now. In 2018, uh, the UK Space Agency commissioned a report to, to survey the sector, um, find out more about it and uh, as part of that report they found that the UK space economy is actually worth 15 billion pounds um, and as of, on the back of that they set a target of growing that sector to 40 billion pounds by 2030 which I believe we're on we're on track to achieve and if you look at one of the figures from that report the, the graph at the bottom of the screen there you can see that more than two-thirds nearly 70 percent of the sector is actually in the application sector so it's in the use of data on the ground, developing new uses and services off the back of space data. And that's really, that's really where uh, I, I come in with this, with this funding program. So just to kind of echo that and repeat that, um, ESA Business Applications is a downstream funding program. And for those that are not familiar with the term downstream uh, and upstream, the space sector is generally divided into two kind of subsectors. So everything to do with kind of building satellites and operating them, uh, building payloads and sensors, integrating them with rockets and launch systems, things that go up into space, we generally refer to as the upstream sector. And everything that comes down from space, so space enabled services, applications, uh, data in the form of images and satellite navigation, communications, we refer to as the downstream sector. So anything that comes down from space. And the ESA Business Applications Program is interested in uh, investing in companies in this space, in the downstream sector, who are innovating and doing new and interesting things with, with space data. So far, we've invested uh, more than 200 million euros uh, in, in 500 businesses across all of our member states. You can see the flags at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and we have a further 222 million allocated to this program over the next three years. Uh, I will answer the question before anyone asks it. This pro funding program won't be affected by Brexit. It's a separate membership to uh, the EU. Uh, so UK businesses will be, can, will be able to con um, continue to access this funding moving forwards. We have a huge range of interests. Um, this is just a quick screen grab from the website uh, on, on some of the funding calls we've got available. We've got interest in transport, energy, education, gaming, uh, immersive technologies connectivity, 5G, sustainable cities. We're really interested in funding projects across a huge range of sectors uh, because space is, is, is ubiquitous and operates across, across all these spaces. I haven't got time today to go into the, into the details of the different kind of space technologies and data that we like, that we like to see integrated into these projects. Um, but but uh, in, in very basic terms, we're interested in projects that integrate navigation, Earth observation or satellite communication into a, a new com commercial service that's going to that's going to um, be useful to, to a, a new customer group or a new user base. 
I've got two quick examples now just to uh, give you a bit of a flavour of the kind of things that have been funded before, just so that you, uh, you have a better idea of, of the kind of projects that we're interested in. So this is a project that was funded through our business incubation centres and uh, they were looking to solve real world challenges in a computer game environment but using real world participants so we've heard a little bit about this in the in the, in the previous panel just now um, so they were integrating satellite images into an established gaming platform which already had a user base and that user base those those players uh, became the real world participants they were playing the game and as a result of that they would be adding uh, digital information uh, additional digitized information to these images which can then be used in a number of different applications and a number of different ways uh, by, by this company after after they've been played so the the user uh, gets to learn a little bit about the topic they're studying and uh, the company blackshaw in this case uh, get additional information attached to those images and in this particular instance this was uh, monitoring the migration of refugee camps in the Middle East uh, a few years ago. This is uh, another example of a project that was funded through the program so this is a Kickstarter project um, and this was designed to develop better situational awareness in extreme environments so it's more in the immersive, uh, immersive technology sector. Uh, that, that this project integrated earth observation satellite data uh, so images from lots of different sources all, all over the world, uh, put those alongside some additional spatial information, buildings, roads, all, all, all the infrastructure, locations, elevation models, weather, and all those kind of things, augmented them together in this immersive platform and uh, provided that data to emergency rescue teams uh, to put them directly in the context of disasters such as earthquakes and floods and forest fires so that they can be better prepared for those events when, when they happen in, in real life. This is the team on the ground in the UK. So uh, there's seven of us that operate uh, around the UK for this program. And all of the support we can give to you is, is pre-submission. So we're here to help you turn your idea into a business proposal, get that down on paper, and ultimately win some funding to, to bring that to life. So you can see uh, th there's people spread throughout the whole of the UK. So there's somebody near to you. And um, we're a very friendly bunch, so I'd, I'd really, really recommend you get in touch if you are interested, just to just to find out more. I wanted to give a quick shout out to the uh, UK Space Agency Space Hubs as well. So this has been announced in the last month. I think uh, Rob mentioned it right at the top of the session uh, about the Surrey and Hampshire Space Hubs. So um, all, all of the people on the screen are involved in at least one of these Space Hubs. I'm involved in the Surrey and Hampshire one. And I think this is just a really, really uh, fantastic initiative to try and build some some momentum and some critical mass around space in the UK. I would recommend if you are interested, take a quick look at the website, business.esa.int. There's a portfolio on there, really extensive portfolio of all the projects that have been funded in the past, as well as all the usual uh, application guidance and contact details. Uh, but it's a really, really good place to start. And um, I, um, I think just about out of time, so I will leave it there. I'm not sure if there's going to be time for questions, uh, but I'll be more than happy to answer them in the, in the chat box. Uh, and I'll be joining the networking later as well. So thank you for listening. And I hope to hear from some of you soon. Lovely. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, please, if you've got any questions for Tom, as, as he says, drop them in the Q&A or the chat box and, uh, and he'll be able to answer them for you. So um, now on to our second panel of the day, focusing on regional strengths of the Enterprise M3 region. So I'd like to welcome Louise Butt, Business Development Manager at the South Coast Centre of Excellence in Satellite Applications to the floor to introduce the session and the panellists. Over to you, Louise. Thank you, Andy. Um, it's, it's fantastic that uh, we've got such a really, really diverse group of people um, uh, in this um, session today. Uh, We've heard a little bit already from, from Rob Dunford talk about the strengths of the EM3 LEP region. It, you know, we've got a hugely successful gaming industry with decades of expertise. Um, and you know, the region is also a significant player in the space sector with over 180 businesses um, accessing space and satellite um, data. So it's really, really exciting. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased to be able to host this cross-sector panel highlighting some of the amazing innovative companies um, 
showing possibilities provided by combining space and immersive technologies. So first of all, we're going to be hearing from our panellists, have, uh, and then we'll have a discussion session after their presentations. So I'll encourage you to put all your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, so to begin with, we've got John Pierre. John Pierre is the Chief Business Officer at Mantle Labs. He's previously held a number of senior agriculture commodity trading roles, uh, and he's currently an advisor to UK Space Agency and Satellite Applications Catapult. So John, please fire away. Um, so we, uh, you know, thanks for everyone uh, for the panelists previously. Uh, this is probably not uh, as exciting as some of the gaming applications we saw prior to this, but uh, hopefully you can see the application of, as Alistair put it, uh, uh, taking pictures from space. And this application is related to crop monitoring in particular. So uh, now we're seeing exactly why this is relevant um, and why our system is, is increasingly critical. We're seeing an extreme and an increased frequency of extreme climate, climate events. This was a graphic shared by us or shared to us by our uh, reinsurance client. And essentially when it comes to agriculture, we're entering a new normal and the traditional knowledge in terms of growing crops is becoming increasingly irrelevant due to this. And I'm sure many of the audience is uh, familiar with this visualization from Re University of Reading, Ed uh, Hawkins. And what we can see here is this is, you know, global phenomena in terms of the change in the climate. And when we break it down into these countries, you can see that it's, it's not just, uh, you know, large centers of population that are affected, but also some of the key growing regions and, and countries in the world. And if, for example, we look at the Ivory Coast, where you can see that, uh, you know, the increased heat and uh, climate change is really taking hold. This is a country which produces 40% of, of global cocoa. So, you know, we can see that it really is changing the growing climate and, um, you know, the, the growing season throughout the world. So what exactly do we do? So we at Manta Labs, we have a system where we're monitoring crops globally using satellite imagery. And one of our USPs is actually trying, you know, being able to remove clouds from the imagery itself. And this is where we say it's a kind of breakthrough technology here. We're mixing many different satellites of different types. Uh, to get a, a seamless daily view of the world unimpeded by clouds. And this is used by our clients who are large reinsurers, banks, seed and input companies for critical decision making. And when we look at the, the granularity of our analysis, we have to go at country scale, regional scale, and field scale. And I'm going to quickly walk you through a few of the um, a few examples of this kind of analysis. Firstly, this is Northern Italy um, in the spring in the height of the, uh, the, well, the first wave of COVID. And here we are helping a seed company really analyze on the ground what crops are being grown and planted. In this, in this case, we're talking about corn. Um, and here we can see what stage the corn crop is in terms of uh, being planted, germinating, emerging. Um, so, from the seed and input company's perspective, they weren't able to go out into the fields and do the analysis that they would typically do due to COVID. But here, using the satellite imagery, they're able to see, yes, the, you know, where the plants are being grown, um, what crop it was, and also, you know, from that planning perspective, what kind of inventories and advice they could give to the local farmers. So here, I guess, a kind of clear application on a kind of uh, regional scale of, of the technology being used. Another example, going back to the Ivory Coast again, and um, you know, you can see with the neighboring country, Ghana as well, these two countries account for two thirds of global cocoa production. So you know, when you have a crop like cocoa, which is very concentrated in production, obviously from anyone who's in the supply chain, it's key to understand if there are any issues. And here, um, this is from earlier this year, we can see there were some issues in terms of um, you know, hotspots and, and there was a, a drought taking place. So working along with our commodities trading clients and also clients in the cocoa and chocolate supply chain, they were able to go out and assist the local farmers and also um, from a kind of planning perspective, head some of their supply risk by looking at uh, additional sources uh, and stock levels uh, going forward. And also um, in terms of being able to look at a regional scale, um, our system is, allows um, you know, food retailers, 
and also traders to look and select different crops here. This is a UK example. Um, you have the options to choose between uh, winter wheat, winter osa, barley, and other crops. And here as well, we're able to see on a regional level, uh, you know, in terms of the wheat crop, that there were some issues uh, or where, which fields had issues. And there, if you think about from an input company perspective, you can go out and, and assist the local farmers and, and, and say, you know, what kind of interventions could be used so we could take remedial action ahead of time and also, um, you know, stop uh, some of the production risks that may be um, coming down the pipeline. So, you know, the system and obviously the beauty of satellite imagery is that we're able to go back in time and give historical context and perspective. So here from a regional perspective, a regional level for Cambridgeshire, we're able to see um, the red line here, how the growing season is evolving over time. And also how does this compare going back into prior seasons? And the UK uh, over the past year, we've had a pretty mixed and I would say disappointing growing season, raining where, when you know, it, it, it probably was inconvenient in terms of the planting time. And during the key growing the stages, there was an extended period of, of no rain. Um, so if you're a food retailer, you're looking at this kind of, um, you know, uh, supply picture coming down the and conditions picture coming down the line. You could take early interventions and see how you're going to source your um, crop of interest. So this is, you know, a whole new level of perspective um, that is offered using the satellite imagery. But it's not just limited to a kind of country and, and regional level. Of course, everything in agriculture, you know, centers around the farm and the farmer. So a real key pillar to our system is being able to assist local farmers uh, throughout the world, you know, really see exactly where the issue spots are in a field level and also incorporating other data sets. So like input cost um, as well, so they can understand the economics and where actually in their farm might be um, you know, less efficient and could also be converted to other uses, um, for example, agroforestry or something else like that. So I hope, you know, obviously this is a, quite a, a, a bit of a quick flyover, but really and truly the power of satellite imagery is, 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 is shown from an agriculture perspective here. We're able to assist people and end users throughout the supply chain um, on a global scale in near real time, make critical decisions and really, um, you know, hopefully make the supply chain and food more efficient um, for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. That's great, John. Thank you very much. We're now going to be joined by Neil Johnston. He's the CEO and founder of Vector Suite and a co-founder of Rocket Desk. So Vector Suite is an immersive VR design software currently used in industrial design sectors. Um, and Vector Suite speeds the creation of initial concept designs as a fast track to 3D. Rocket Desk is one of Europe's largest game industry focused co-working spaces. And the Vector Suite team is also based within the Rocket Desk, uh, Desk studio. So uh, Neil, take it away. Sure. Uh, well, it's uh, nice to be with you all uh, this morning for the, for this uh, session, and uh, great to highlight a bit of the work that we are doing uh, in the area as part of these regional successes. So, Better Suite is a concept designs tool, primarily for three um, D design for designers that are designing in the automotive space, but it's also applicable to architecture and other aspects of industrial design. Um, we've been around for a couple of years now, three or four years since we kind of got the first concepts. Um, so a bit of background about me, I'm previously based in the creative industry sector. Uh, I had seven years in the music industry, I was running a record label. And then uh, I kind of transitioned through that phase towards focusing on apps and trying to meet the requirements we were getting as we started to move into education and music education from teachers that were starting to use iPads in schools, primarily in America where they were seeing the, the need to sort of burn textbooks and start adopting new technologies. And uh, we, we created apps that uh, enabled them to, to utilize the, the new technologies in a more appropriate way. And then that led to me uh, getting alongside a whole bunch of programmers and developers in the local area of Guildford. And we founded a co-working space called Rocket Desk, which has become one of Europe's largest co-working uh, communities actually uh, for the games industry. And part of what I'm here to talk about today is not only what we're doing as a business in the local area, but also championing Guildford and all hail Guildford, the Hollywood of video games and 
often uh, surprising to people that we meet in the Guildford community. You know, uh, a lot of people don't realize the, the, the weight of um, significance of the Guildford Games community. And I just want to really briefly highlight that before we kind of carry on. Um, we've got some of the biggest, uh, most popular games in the history of the video game sector being made right in Guildford in the leafy suburb of London. And, um, you know, looking at some of this list here, Populous, Dungeon Keeper, Theme Park, these all came from one of the, the early um, pioneers of games technology based on the Surrey Research Park, a, a, a company called Bullfrog Productions, which was later sold to EA Games. And also, actually, Populous was probably the first 3D games engine ever made. And that was made right here in Guildford, which is crazy um, when, when you consider the, the grandiose nature of that. So uh, we've got all these brilliant uh, games teams in town. We've got about 4,000 people employed in the Guildford uh, area, all from the games industry. And what we're starting to see is as the games technology develops and grows and becomes more appropriate to AR and VR, as we've, we've seen in this previous session, um, with real-time graphics, we can start getting a, a, a look at uh, how this might overlay into the real world. I'm just going to highlight, this is actually a video, I've put the sound down, but this will probably appear quite jerky, so I'm, I'm going to pause it in a second to show you the sort of level of quality that we can get out of games engines. Uh, most of you will probably be familiar with this, but just in case you need a little bit of context into why we are focused on design, this is the sort of content we can get, the sort of photorealism that we can get out of games engines today. This is all an Unreal Engine showreel I'm showing you here. And you can see that this could just be a, a photo or, or a video that you would expect to have been filmed in person, but every single asset within this view is a 3D model inside the Unreal Engine. So what we're trying to do as a, as a company is take this games technology and take it to the design space of automotive. And the automotive sector are really keen on VR. They, they've been an early adopter. These are very early examples you're seeing on your screen now where we're immersing designers in uh, this virtual environment, allowing them to create and, and sketch and draw. So these are a few examples of other applications that are out there. Furthest on the right-hand side there is Gravity Sketch. In the middle is uh, Tilt Brush. And I believe the, the one on the far left is probably just uh, a made up image to kind of show, show what's uh, possible or the, the approach at least. So for us as um, in, in our work with the automotive industry, we are taking a traditional pipeline that's existed for over 50 years and we're trying to change it to be much more efficient using uh, immersive technology. So this is your traditional automotive design pipeline. Every car that you have on your on your driveway or that you've ridden in at some point today over the past week or so was initially a concept sketch. Uh, a very uh, a talented designer has sat down and sketched the car that you drive and they start as a theme, uh, this kind of rough sketch theme of what they're looking to do. And we're using McLaren as an example here, who were our first public use case of our software. So we've got this uh, sketch of number one here, number two, how the sketch gets refined. And usually this is just in Photoshop or, or some other sketch tools. And um, they, can, they can get a rough theme for the design. And then that transitions over to uh, a 3D model where a, a cast modeler, a 3D modeler is trying to interpret the sketch design. So what we're doing in Vector Suite is we're taking this three week process, um, which is the typical length of time it takes to convert from 2D to 3D. And we are enabling designers in one day to get to a, a 3D model that they can use within a game engine or they can export to Autodesk or any of the other applications that they typically use as part of their design theme. So yeah, really excited to be working in this space. We've seen some great work across the world with all the different uh, companies that we're working with, but we're still waiting on, on the catch up of, of technology to the, the certainly hardware to make this more accessible. And I think I heard some of that just uh, briefly before we entered this session um, where we're looking at, you know, we're really looking for the Google Glass overlay of digital content into our everyday world. And where Vector Suite is going to sit within that is we're here to empower anyone that can sketch on the back of a napkin, anyone who can take a pen in their hand and draw beautiful uh, creations. We want to empower them to be able to create those in 3D and cut out the technical process of making a 3D model and actually just give the user the access to the content creation inside these uh, immersive worlds. So that's Vector Suite. That's what we do. And uh, thanks for listening.
Hi, Neil. Uh, great, Neil. Thank you for that. Uh, we now have, we're really uh, fortunate to be joined by Stuart Mardell, who's the VP for TriTech Technology. He's been in sales and marketing since the 80s, working mainly in industrial export markets. And he joined Vision Engineering in 2007 as Director of Sales and in 2018 became the VP of Vision uh, Engineering's daughter company, Vision TriTech. Uh, so, Stuart, take it away, please. Thanks very much for that. Um, good morning, all. Um, very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you for the next five or so minutes about immersive viewing and stereoscopic visualization. When I say um, immersive viewing and stereoscopic visualization, most of you, I imagine, will immediately think of some form of headgear whether that's VR headsets or special glasses that try to separate information from each eye to generate a stereo effect. You'll be familiar with polarizing glasses and the active shutter glasses and um, anaglyph glasses that you've seen at the cinemas. But at the same time, you're probably also mindful of some of the issues that these headsets and glasses can create. VR headsets, for example, that can be disorientating or isolating and uncomfortable, or the glasses that are well known for introducing flickering, ghosting, and crosstalk. They also reduce the light delivered to your eyes, and none of the solutions are particularly ergonomic. What Vision Engineering has developed is a brand new technology known as TriTech technology, that is a glasses-free solution for users who need a level of immersive viewing and stereoscopic visualization. The deep reality viewer, we call it the DRV for short, is a stereoscopic display system that allows users to see subjects in stereoscopic 3D without needing glasses, which means the image you see is much brighter than what you'd see with a glasses-based technology, and there's no degradation of the image resolution or clarity. The stereo images are aligned by the system's optical layout, giving you a natural perception of depth. And the digital nature of the stereo image means that live images can be captured and shared with other DRV users, either locally or across the globe um, in real time and in stereo. So how does it avoid the need to wear headgear? Well, using our 60 years of optical know-how, the DRV is projecting two independent optical channels through these lenses that you can see in the top left image so that each eye sees the subject from a slightly different angle which replicates our natural stereo vision and depth perception. You can see here in the bottom left image the two optical channels reaching his eyes so that each image is sharp, bright and with absolutely no flicker, ghosting or crosstalk. Despite the technology being brand new, we're already finding applications in a range of areas such as, such as virtual product development and medical imaging, surgical and dentistry applications, but importantly to today's audience in geospatial imaging and game development. And in these two areas, we are at quite different stages of market readiness. In game development, the DRV is compatible already with Unreal Engine and Unity. The use of the DRV allows a game developer the opportunity to test their code without having to constantly put on and take off the VR goggles. It's a much more ergonomic solution and it's time saving. In the geospatial imaging sector, We've developed a market specific version of the DRV, which is known as Contour, and it's compatible with all of the stereo supporting software packages, and it's available now with deliveries already being made. Users will appreciate that the special glasses that they have to wear for viewing in stereo is effectively halving the information delivered to each eye. Well, the Contour actually does the opposite in that each eye is receiving its full quota of information, so your brain is receiving double the information. This makes it ideal for applications where image clarity and ease of use over long periods is paramount. Now, 
How did we get here? Well, Vision Engineering is an optical company that's been designing and manufacturing optical inspection systems and measuring equipment since 1958. We're based in Woking in Surrey, and we supply manufacturing customers in industrial environments, predominantly, all over the world. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, I'm going to be available this afternoon if you want to chat about this uh, anymore. But for the moment, bye for now. That's great, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, we now have our final panellist, that's In Space Missions. We're going to be uh, joined by uh, Doug Liddell. He's joining Susan Jason. So uh, Susan has 21 years experience working in space industries. Uh, working on disaster monitoring constellations, including the world's first system to deliver daily imaging from anywhere on the globe. And she joins uh, in space missions in 2019. Um, and Doug, Doug's previously worked for Surrey Satellites as a spacecraft systems engineer. And over the following years, he developed several new spacecraft, including Europe's first Galileo demonstration satellite. Um, and he's run the science and exploration business unit and delivered multiple satellites and optical imaging payloads in, um, including the UK's first cubes. That's some really interesting insights I'm hoping we're going to have. Um, they're going to be taking the, uh, their presentation in, from two angles. Doug's going to be covering space time, talking about how the space sector can make an offering into the immersive sector. And Susan's going to be talking through outreach and collaborative engineering activities. So more about how immersive sector can support the space sector. I'll leave it to you, Doug and Susan. Brilliant, thank you. Can everybody see our slides? Um, I hope so. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, yeah, as explained, I'm Susan Jason. I'm a principal engineer at InSpace Missions, and Doug is the CEO. I'm going to hand over. Oh, start my video. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And Doug is going to be sort of giving you an introdu introduction to the company, what we do, um, and exactly as as uh, Louise said, how we believe that um, we can help enable space for all and allow people to harness the power of space data in immersive tech and gaming and I'll be talking a bit later about the flip side of that so I'm gonna try and move on the slide there you are Doug over to you please okay uh, thanks a lot Susan um very quickly uh, we offer space to manage service we've got our own satellites and we've got a really experienced team um, uh, in space there are over 250 years experience between us and we managed to I don't know if we fudged it we got to about 100 space missions that we've had various involvement in as individuals and as a company so um, yeah we're quite pleased with our level of experience that we we know what we're doing in the space sector the immersive is a entirely different kettle of fish though so um, Susan if you could do me a favour and move on to the next one please so a few years ago, we dreamt up this idea of space time. And actually we went out and we found some friends um, to talk to because uh, we believe in collaboration and we, we're, we're strongly of the view that if you don't know how to do something, then sometimes trying to reinvent the wheel isn't the best answer. And sometimes it's best to go and find the experts. And at the time, a few years ago, we discovered a company called Rewind that some of you will know, um, uh, Sol Rogers and, and the guys there uh, over in St Albans. And they'd been doing a really interesting spacewalk thing for the BBC. Um, and it seemed to match very much what we wanted to do, which was to provide this idea of a fully immersive experience from space. Um, and it was a case of bringing together people with high end VR uh, on the ground, um, combining that with real time downlink um, uh, a spacecraft and then putting that in space. Um, in fact, actually, some of the early um, ideas around space time came in discussions with um, Andy Bennett. We were doing a, a study at the time that Andy was part of as well. So, um, so Andy was there pretty much near the conception of, of space time. Um, and, and the key thing for us was about making it real time. And it was trying to understand how fast could you get that data from a 360 camera on a satellite down to the ground how good would the high-end VR be such that you could then put that together and create the experience of virtually being in space right now? Um, and you know, this was the, uh, uh, this was the uh, system that we designed. And then we worked with Rewind quite closely and tried to pull together a combined company offering. Susan, could you do me the favor, please? And you know, part of it, it's this whole thing, you know, Ed White, the first American to walk in space. Um, coming back in, it's the saddest moment in my life. And actually that experience, um, of, of doing a spacewalk, of being in space, you, you hear people talking about the overview effect and 
you know, harks back to the, the comments earlier about, you know, the best first thing you discovered really when they went to space was you discover the earth and, you know, the overview effect of people going up there and appreciating their place in the universe and understanding the world and understanding, you know, that the, the planet isn't divided by uh, political borders. It's actually, it's, it's a geographical entity. It's an ecosystem. It's interactions across the whole planet. And it's, you know, trying to get everyone to appreciate that kind of was our goal. So there was an element of um, philanthropy in this as well and environmentalism and how we were doing it. Um, next one, please. And edutainment, I think. Edutainment, edutainment is a word that comes through. And I think that's what we've heard today. That's so important to people that they, they want to be engaged and brought into whatever they're doing. So I think that goes on to what you were looking at in terms of the market, Doug. Yeah, no, absolutely, Susan. Um, so you're right. And, you know, it was everything from this VR experience, but then, you know, how could we take that into, into an AR app and so that people could start to appreciate things happening on the planet in real time and we could start to fuse other data layers on it. You know, at the time, we sort of appreciate that myself and the co-founder uh, of Space Time, we were kind of taking the old hippie approach if we just wanted to go in a flotation tank with a headset on and feel like we were floating in space. And actually, as soon as we started talking to the Rewind guys and some of the younger people in our team, they were saying, ah, look all the different data layers you can use on top of that. You know, this is really interesting. You know, everything from sort of Twitter alerts going off and blah, 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 that would allow people, you know, everything from disaster monitoring to um, monitoring fisheries to people controlling satellites in orbit and working out what to do next. Um, so just briefly finishing on space time, where it is, it's kind of in a holding pattern at the moment, because the one thing we discovered, which is, to our mind interesting is that when we spoke to people in the immersive sector and customers and investors um, because it's a software dominated industry they were asking us to have things that they could go to market with in sort of three to six months um, and that wasn't compatible with building a spacecraft and launching it which even if you're going really great guns is 12 to 18 months um, and when we spoke to the space sector they said that's fantastic love the idea but where's the market and they didn't understand the immersive market so we struggled really hard with investors. Um, our plan had been to get a camera up there on our own buck and we did that last year but unfortunately uh, we had a rocket failure and that satellite um, re-entered and went in the ocean <laughs> so <laughs> lost at sea is how we're, we're treating it. So um, we're going to try and get another camera up in the next year um, and then we can start to then go and stimulate the market what we think the real data would look like. Um, Susan. Yeah, and so from my perspective, when, when I saw what was being offered, there were two things that jumped out was what, what you can do in terms of the research and your engineering development. And that harks back to what Neil from Vector Suite was saying was actually what can we use within our business? So it was almost like turning it on its head, really, and understanding, OK, within the company, we've got work that we need to do. We want to be standing around a virtual satellite. We want to be having colleagues that are on site and off site being able to interact and engage in that design process. So that was something that we could see being very powerful in terms of efficiency savings. But also, to be perfectly honest, it's something that we've, we've all grown to expect from looking at what's in, in the gaming environment and what's on, on Marvel films. And yet it feels so far away. So that was one problem that we were thinking, well, how do we get that and how do we benefit from that? And then the other side was actually we go out and do an awful lot within the region, within the community, within schools. And we wanted to be able to give people that you know, edutainment, um, as we say. So we wanted to understand how can we do it? Because what we've ended up with is taking in one little headset and people, are, you know, you've got 30 children asking you questions and queuing and pushing the child that's basically got the headset. It's really impractical for us in a, to engage people in, in that sort of way. So there's all sorts of real here and now examples that we want to be doing. So it's almost so turning it on its head and saying, actually, we also see there's a huge amount that the immersive tech and gaming community can do for us within our engineering business within the space industry. And again, there's so much cross sector um, strength in high tech within the region, marine, aviation, you know, um, space game you know why can't we bring that together and share the commonalities so that we can actually start to exploit it here and now so i think that was the the key points really that we wanted to make and the thing you can't forget is you know as you were saying susan about you know the marvel films etc the the thing that gets you know space and immersive are two of the things that gets people and the general public really excited i think there was exactly. stats like the, the 
the most live streamed things in the last however many years were Felix Baumgartner yeah. jumping from the edge of space or or the SpaceX Falcon 9 launch, you know, and it's sci-fi films that sit at the top of the charts. You know, it's, it's people love this stuff. And if you can bring space and immersive together as a as a service to the to the consumer and to, you know, even not even consumers, just, you know, children, you know, then yeah. it's, it gets really exciting. It's a great way to get a message across and do STEM and, and to, to perform outreach at every age group. And help us with our jobs. And we've taken too long. So thank you for your Sorry. time. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's great, Doug, Susan, thank you so much. Uh, really, really appreciate it. We're now gonna move on to uh, questions uh, and have a discussion session. I believe we've got just short of 10 minutes. Um, so to kick off, we've had a question in the Q&A. Uh, this one's um, for John. Does the imaging from satellite have the ability to track particular infestations, maybe fungal or insect from imagery? Uh, yeah, that's a yeah, definitely that's a good question. Um, and this is where we see the power of combining remote sensing with other forms of data. So, for example, you can combine what we see with weather data to build a really robust model that uh, not only says, for example, that there is something going on, but potentially in incorporating weather forecasts, there is a high probability that you could have some kind of infestation. And this is something we actually give to farmers. Um, in, in countries like in, in Southeast Asia, where they could see, you know, a, you know, there's a high probability, for example, that you're going to have some kind of um, issue because you're combining different kinds of um, precip and other weather variables with the imagery. So that's definitely something we do. Okay, that's great, John. Thank you. Next question is for Stuart. Stuart, what's the application of your technology in dentistry? Well, it's, it's a slightly different application, allowing dentists and surgeons an opportunity for heads up viewing. So you, you may have seen uh, attempts have been made for surgeons or dentists to view the patient, um, but having a stereo view that allows them a magnified image um, where they present the image on a interlaced polarized screen and have to wear glasses or uh, polarized glasses to see the image. With the DRV and, and a camera, a stereo camera arrangement, it's possible that the camera is, is over the, the patient or the patient's mouth and the image is displayed on the DRV uh, in such a position that allows the uh, surgeon or the dentist to view the image stereoscopically and magnified on the DRV. So th it's an application that it's um, being investigated. We have a couple of um, projects going on at the moment. Um, uh, the big advantage is that the image clarity is so much sharper than what's being able to be achieved with um, the polarized uh, alternative. Okay. Um, there's clearly that. some interest in the technology, Stuart, though I've got another question. Uh, it, have you applied your technology to museum environments, um, visualization of virtual exhibits, perhaps? Uh, another very good question. Um, the answer is no, but it's work in progress. So keep in mind, this, this technology is brand spanking new. It, it's really hot off the press. And so... Um, in, in, in terms of museums, we're, we're talking to the folks at um, Historic England, um, and had COVID not been in the way, we would have made a lot more progress in, in developing that interest, and because one of the, the um, application areas is for viewing relics and what have you in a museum environment. Um, and the DRV is, is perfectly suited because you don't have to get close to it in order to enjoy the stereo view. It can be contained in a, in, a, in a casing so that grubby hands can't touch anything that they shouldn't. Um, my biggest challenge this year has been I'm trying to promote and develop a product that offers stereo imaging. And the only way you can see it is to be stood in front of it. You cannot enjoy it on a 2D media like a, a web conference. And so you can imagine COVID has put the mockers on so much progress this year that um, I can't wait for next year to come and we can start meeting people and then I can get people to sit in front of the, the system and they, they can see what I'm harping on about. Uh, I absolutely hear you there, Stuart. I'm sure we'll all be pleased to get back to the yeah, Absolutely. Um, next question for, for Neil. Uh, 
what does the future look like for games technologies and, and why should the everyday consumer be interested? Yeah, well, so, you know, I think we are, we've got this really bright future ahead of us where we are going to eventually see this overlay of XR in our world, right? And we're going to see uh, the technology hardware to drive it in a really believable way. And that's some of the stuff that Stuart's doing right there. You know, we've, we've been to see some of that technology is it's brilliant, you know, being able to not wear a headset and access some 3D content. But I think in, you know, in the next 10 years, from our side of things, we want to see every aspect of, uh, of industrial design being able to be sketched within the, within the, uh, the, the software medium as well. But, you know, I think we're going to see the overlay of digital content everywhere. You know, your fridge, your the, the available walls in your home. You know, I think this stuff will become uh, much more engaging. And obviously that comes up with a whole bunch of risks, but really this is a, a bright opportunity for humanity. And I think we can keep coming up with great products that, that ultimately make everyone's lives easier and better. And then we'll lead on to, I don't know, the next step, whatever that might be. Absolutely. It, it does sound like the stuff of movies, you know, having these multiple kind of digital layers that you can interact and interface with. It made well, me wonder. Just one more thing I was going to say, actually, was that, the, you know, everyone sees this minority report thing where yep. you're like swiping it around. And, and quite often in a lot of these presentations that we've seen, we've all kind of used these overlay um, images of someone wearing a headset, you know, I saw one there, the guy holding the globe and, you know, ultimately it's still not quite there yet. It's so frustrating. Like we're, we're, we're inches away. We can get the visualization, but being able to grab that and throw it around and move and, and interact with it is, is kind of the next step. We're all waiting for that. And when that comes, then we've got proper engagement. And uh, ultimately we don't need to pretend with a lot of these images where you're bringing something in, but actually we will be able to create the content and it's going to be a thing of beauty. Absolutely. So, you know, definitely for that kind of full immersive experience, um, which kind of made me uh, quite interested in one of the, the things that Doug and Susan mentioned, which is obviously about, you know, having the experience, but then in, incorporating kind of additional data layers. Do you, either of you have a thought about what those additional data layers could be? What, what kind of information do you think is going to also factor into to space time? Doug, you're on mute. Sorry, nine months and I'm still forgetting to unmute myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we looked at loads of different, so a lot of it would be um, uh, based around people, you know, so it's adding on layers in terms of people movements and um, populations um, being able to, you know, things that we could respond to quickly, whether it's, you know, adding traffic layers, which probably isn't that interesting because Google already does that or responding to social media, if it was possible to location tag any of that. It's, it's really, you know, it's one of these things is the more you poke it, um, the more things pop out because if it's a real time system, it's, you know, what you have at the moment with Google, uh, Google Maps and, you know, when you look at the Google Earth terrain is you're seeing pictures that are a weeks old or years old in some cases. And it's the idea that actually, no, I can drill down if I can get the, you know, if you eventually end up with quite a high resolution system, which is where we were aiming and are aiming, then you'll be able to drill down and say, okay, is there a traffic jam at the end of my road this morning? Okay, and more on demand. Yeah. You know, and you can, you can take that, you can, you know, you can put the Google light traffic layer on top of that, but then you can drill down further. So that it's, it's, you know, air quality, all of this stuff, it's, it can be really useful. Okay, that's great. I'm afraid we are running out of time and I'm sure there's plenty of questions. So I would encourage people to, you know, join in the, the networking later. Um, uh, but I'll hand back to Andy. So, oh, Andy. Thank you very much, Louise. And thank you again to all the panellists for that great session. I mean, again, it was really exciting to see, the, hear the enthusiasm from the speakers. I just picked out a few words, a few phrases there, you know, Guildford being the Hollywood of the game sector, a bright opportunity for humanity, space and immersive being two really exciting and innovative fields, engaging the young and performing outreach. You know, I think, well, I've come away more excited and more enthusiastic about, about the intersection between these technologies through this, um, through this event today. And I hope you as attendees and panelists have as well. It's um, a really exciting time, to be honest. So, um, as I said, we haven't got through all the questions, but please, we'll, we'll, we'll try and distribute them to our panelists and get responses back to you. Um, and we hope that uh, if you can, you'll join the meeting mojo uh, thing this afternoon, or um, if Asha's ready, I'll invite her just to quickly demo the virtual reality platform.
platform as well. Asha, are you available to do that? Yeah, um, we're using a desktop based a platform as well. So you don't have to have a heads up for this, but um, I'll just share my screen really quickly. I'll share the link to download the platform. When you get in, you just create an avatar. The reception looks just like this. Um, and then all you have to do is click go to and the top left partner rooms and then Immerse UK, that's it. And then you'll arrive in the Immerse UK kind of boardroom if you wanna have a wander around and meet people. Or um, if you set up a meeting, a meeting mojo, you can ask people to meet you in there instead of using Zoom. Okay. Lovely, thank you, Asha. Um, just before um, we go, I've just got a few more uh, announcements to make. Um, we are supporting a Horizon 2020 project called UFO. It's all about helping geospatial companies develop products and services in the maritime transport creative industries, as well as solutions to tackle climate change. The funding call is open now, um, and there's a link in the chat box coming up. Um, this is a Horizon 2020 project, but please be aware it will be open to UK companies even after uh, January the 1st, whatever happens. So please, uh, please do apply. Um, next year, we're going to be supporting a key event, Spacecom Expo, the 25th and 26th of May. We'll be running a geospatial theatre focusing on the topics of maritime and spatial finance. So be sure to put those dates in the diary. Look out for registration going live in the new year. Hopefully it'll be one of the first times we'll get to meet again face to face. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, we'll, our focus next year is also on tackling next zero in the build up to uh, COP26. So we want to showcase what the power of place can do for people um, and perhaps involve some immersive tech in that as well. So please do sign up to our newsletters to get more information on this. Please get in touch with Luca Videlo or myself as part of the Geospatial Network or Asha as part of the uh, Immerse UK Network. Um, so I think that's all I've got to say with this, but uh, thank you very much to everyone participating today. Uh, all the panelists, fantastic presentations, fantastic discussion, um, and to the backroom staff who make all of this happen as well. Andra and from Marketing and Comms and Poonam from Events. Without uh, your help, we couldn't do this. So we really appreciate everything you do. And um, happy Christmas to all, one and all. If I don't see you or don't speak to you again before then. Thank you very much. <laughs>